Fred. Right. And we're live. So uh, welcome to the fifth chai time. We've still got uh, 30 seconds for everyone to turn up. Um, but while we're waiting for, for the last uh, minute or so, I just thought I'd explain how I make my chai in the Shah household. So in, in the, we live in an Indian house and uh, chai is traditionally made with uh, uh, loose tea and um, you boil it with the milk in about one third to two thirds ratio and you add a very authentic Indian spice. Uh, and then uh, you can uh, add some brandy in it if you want. That's how you traditionally make it in India. Or then you can put your chai aside and open your homemade traditional cider, which is, <laughs> which is the other way we do it. So, um, so I'd like to open up the fifth chai time and uh, say cheers to you guys and thank you very much for attending it. Pete, I know you have your beer with you. It's good to see. And Catherine, you have your tea. You were being very good. I'm on tea. <laughs> but I'm so, going to read it in a Northern Irish way, which is stew the tea bag and add copious amounts of milk. <laughs> I've given up the sugar. Exactly. Very good. Well, this, this is uh, homemade. So I made it from the apples from the garden with my daughter. And I can see it's got tons and tons of sugar in it. Um, it's kept its fears. It's about two years old now. Um, and the taste actually has got better over the, over the period. So it's actually my last bottle. But anyway, enough about my Indian chai. And uh, over to Pete, really, to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Hi there, yeah. So my name is Pete Adamson. So I'm VP and head of the Retinal <coughs> Disease Area Stronghold um, at Janssen. Um, prior to that, I was um, senior vice president at a co small company in the Netherlands called ProQR, where I worked on inherited retinal diseases, specifically developing uh, intravitreal antisensor like nucleotides. And prior to that, I was uh, Vice President Head of Discovery at GlaxoSmithKline. Um, I, that was my, essentially my first industry job. Prior to that, I was um, a professor of, of um, experiment and pathology at UCL, um, part of uh, the Institute of Ophthalmology. And I actually still hold an honorary position there with the same title. Um, <clears throat> and so I've been doing uh, ophthalmology through an academic, a biotech setting, or a big pharma setting for about 25 years now. Oh. So, so when did you realize you're an underachiever and that you actually should do more in your life? <laughs> yeah, uh, just right now. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Okay, over to you, Catherine. My name is Catherine Beach. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Exonate Limited. Um, this company has been in existence since the end of 2013. We are currently working in ophthalmology. Prior to that, I did medicine. Then I went into Big Pharma, works at Leatherly Laboratories, it then got acquired. I then worked for Pharmatalia, it got acquired. I then went to DuPont Merck and it got acquired. So I have a history of people buying my companies, which is a good thing. Um, J and J, take note, <laughs> buying the companies. <laughs> you never know. So, so uh, I've worked in an awful lot of therapeutic areas. I um, initially, was developing cardiovascular drugs. Then I went into neurology and was doing Parkinson's disease. Then um, we did HIV. And then I went into small companies and I've done several small companies, medical devices and small molecules. That's a, that's a great background and career, Catherine. And, you're, and a real wonder, I have, to say, I have to say, as I put it in my introductory note, there's very few people, uh, CEO entrepreneurs, who have such a strong background in the UK, and it's uh, it makes it um, a pleasure to, to work with you on Exonate. So I'm just going to go straight into a little bit of uh, about the deal, and everyone was going to want to know this. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask Pete, what can you tell us about the deal and how it's structured and um, uh, how, uh, and how you're collaborating exactly with Exonate? Yeah, so it's sort of a fairly standard type of deal and one, one that I, I particularly pushed for. So what it is, is um, it's essentially a collaboration and option to license. Uh, and so really the way it works is, you know, Exonet have taken it to the, the sort of end of the preclinical stage. So really what, what we're able to do is, um, is pay for the studies, so pay for the clinical studies. Uh, and we work through a JSC, so we, we want to... Uh, we want to be part of um, the ongoing science and clinical development. Uh, but basically, at the end of that proof of concept study, um, we then have an option to acquire the technology. And, you know, internally, we sort of um, work out in our own minds 
what we think success will look like. Um, and then really from that, the program would become, would come straight in house uh, and we would take over all sort of, um, you know, um, registration development and, and actually, and build out into potentially other indications from the so, initial. So in summary, it's a collaboration where you work together with Exonate uh, on the program, which then may lead to, a, a, which is essentially an option to, to do a licensing deal in the future, which will trigger further payments. Uh, what can you tell us about the numbers and, and uh, how much money is involved? Yeah, so um, the, the, short, the short answer to that is I can't. Not That's a lot. Something we would normally publish. Um, but it's a significant deal. Um, you know, we're taking on all the development costs. Um, we essentially pay uh, an upfront. Obviously, we want to be able, we want an x to be enabled to keep the lights on, to pay their staff. Um, and um, we pretty much pay the entire cost of doing the study. So really, we're, we're paying uh, for just about everything that's, that's, that's nuts and bolts of the study. Uh, and at that point, obviously, there is there is a, a milestone payment um, to when we would um, exercise the option, and then there's future milestone payments. Um, and I, I, I knew Pete, I knew Pete couldn't answer that question, but I had to answer it before I get lots and lots of questions about it. Um, but people know typically what kind of deals these are done for, and this is one that's I would say that's uh, pretty typical for biotech, and um, uh, it's, it's uh, I think it's. Uh, an interesting deal for both X and A and J and J. And I want to come to that. So, so Catherine, what can you say about the collaboration? How did you, so to go back in time a bit, how did you start talking with uh, J and J? What made you decide, actually, you have a number of options in front of you as to whether to collaborate with a big pharma, raise further funds, go it alone. Uh, what was your sort of decision point in that? And can you tell us a little about how you, how you got to J and J? Yep. Um, Right from the get-go, when we formed this company, we started talking to as many big pharma companies as I could get in front of. Not because I thought they would do a deal with us, but we were pretty naive. We were trying to build a team. We didn't really have the, the wherewithal or the skills in-house to do this. And by going to big pharma on a show and tell, so this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying to achieve. We actually learned masses from each individual company who passed on a bit of helpful advice, which we took. Um, I really expected that we would be in a position to do a deal with Big Pharma when we got to the end of phase one, because there have been very public failures of people trying to get eye drops. And at some time, we probably should talk about what it is we're trying to do. But... Um, there had been public failures in the area that we're in, and there was generally a feeling amongst Big Pharma that it wasn't possible to get an eye drop to the back of the eye. And so I wanted to understand from them better what had gone right and what had gone wrong. Why do you not think we could get an eye drop there? So we were fairly um, well, tartish, I suppose, in, in just going around everybody. And um, when people said, you're too early to do a deal, we said, absolutely, we're, we're not expecting you to do a deal with us now, but we want to tell you what we're doing and we'd like to come back. This time next year, we'll tell you what we've done. That was mainly because I felt that if you set an expectation of what you would achieve, and then you came back and said, I did it, and then you came back in a year and said, yep, I did my next one, that people would begin to believe in you. And that happened, that people began to give us more in-depth advice, not just about the science we were doing, but how they would position the clinical trials, how they would position it in the market. Um, how did we find J&J? &J? Um, they were on the list of people we were talking to. Initially, they had said that they were not interested in the fellowship. They, were not, they weren't building a franchise there, and it wasn't something they wanted to do. And then... J&J &J changed their mind. They hired Pete, who we had met in previous lives. So they hired Pete and Pete brought us to the table. And that was probably January, February, the last time we spoke to them and they said no. And then so, so just, just, yep. and they said, we'll take a look. So just a briefly about the landscape of actually how, uh, you know, because a lot of biotechs, small biotechs would love to do a deal 
uh, with a, with a big farmer. Did you, was it something? Did you have to talk to lots and lots of farmers? Was it quite a difficult process? How did you meet them? Um, and then did you keep the deal competitive when you actually did a deal? Um, I talked to every single big farmer that was working in ophthalmology several times. I work. I also spoke to a lot of the small biotech ones working in ophthalmology. I spent quite a lot of time um, researching who was in the space, who might be in a position at some time to do a deal with us. And then I tracked down an individual in each company that I thought would be key in championing it because you can't do a deal unless you have an internal champion. So I tracked down in each of those companies, somebody that I thought might be helpful. And I did that by looking at who was speaking at ophthalmology conferences and what they were saying and then thinking you don't you don't get to speak at say AAO unless you are the champion within the company so then I track them down um so, so, so yeah no so I, so you know you kept you you, you really you, the interesting point there is actually you started talking to J and J even though they didn't even have a group then at that time so you kind of just had to lay it out there and talk to lots of companies and then let things evolve and so yeah. when you're actually ready to do a deal then you know because things change in big farm as well as we know it's therapeutics uh, yeah. certain areas are not attractive one year the following year they're, they're all over it so you have to keep talking to the companies and you did as I know went out to a lot of um, conferences to talk to Big Pharma trying to identify those champions um, let me just ask a uh, Peter question there is actually something from uh, one of the audience uh, was from Bob Boyle and he's just just coming back to the license deal I don't know if you saw the question there Bob but can Janssen exercise a breakpoint at any time I don't know if you can answer that it's quite specific <laughs> I'll let you answer that if you want um Exercise a breakpoint? Not really. So, um, well, the breakpoint really be, be, is the option. So, one of the things that we wouldn't do, I mean, you know, in, in agreeing to fund the, say, the clinical studies to the POC outcome, you know, we realize that a company like Exonate doesn't have the money um, to go do that and to hire the CRO and to pay all the costs. So, we, we couldn't, we, in a sense, would have to warranty um, and have warrantied essentially that we would pay all those costs. So anything that, that um, XNET have agreed to financially, legally, we will cover. So that will take us all the way to the option point. But the break point is the option point. Thank you for that. And on the other side of the coin, really, Catherine is saying how she basically threw lots of stuff around until something stuck and happened to stick with you. How did you find... Uh, um, the XNET program? Why did you particularly find this attractive? What was it about the program? Yeah, so I first saw this program when I was working at Glasser Smith Line. I mentioned earlier that I was VP of Discovery Ophthalmology. And we then had a, a molecule called Pazopinib. So Pazopinib was, when I joined uh, GSK, Pazopinib was, was already in the clinic as an eye drop. It was a repurposed cancer drug, an actual marketed molecule. And um, the cancer group that took that into the, into the clinical study in ophthalmology really didn't do anything like the right studies and ultimately that failed. But sometimes there's, there's, there's knowledge in failure. And, um, and then when I saw this new molecule come along and, and the unique thing about the x molecule is this is the first time that I've ever been aware of a molecule that had a built in optimization program, which included permeability, scleral permeability to get to the retina. No, no molecule, uh, not the Pazopinib, not the Novartis molecule, um, had really ever done that. All, to, all up until then, it had been repurposed molecules and continues to be outside of what Exonate have done. So I was pretty keen, um, but it was again too early, we had Pazopinib. So it was some years later, really, when I moved to J&J, &J, um, uh, to Janssen. And be between me accepting the job at Janssen and, and, um, and starting on day one, um, I had essentially three months in which to consider what I wanted to do when I get there. I didn't want to waste the time. So actually on day two of my employment uh, at Janssen, I called Catherine and said, I've been aware of this for quite a while. I would like to take a look at it. And that, that was how we initiated that. Can, and just a, a further question, because and you were talking about the technology. Can you just explain a little bit about what, if this is successful, what it would mean for patients? Yeah. So, so how, how is it treated today? the particular indication you're looking at and if this is successful what would it mean for patients directly yeah so 
This, the, the FA molecule um, is, a, is a molecule that's called an SRPK1 inhibitor. And really what that does is it, it, it um, regulates the amount of VEGF-A and VEGF-B and um, inhibiting it um, overproduces VEGF-B at the expense of VEGF-A. Now it's VEGF-A that's the bad actor in va uh, retinal vascular disease. And so because it's a non-invasive therapy, I think there's great utility. So my ambition is to treat um, retinal vascular disease early, particularly diabetic disease. So um, the, many, many people may not know this, but um, the, the injectable VEGF neutralizing agents are approved for diabetic macular edema, which is a, um, a disease where the blood vessels in the retina leak fluid, and that leak fluid gives you an edematous retina and it affects your vision. And, and these drugs, the drugs, the, the injectables are very good at controlling that. But they're also approved for diabetic retinopathy, which is the forerunner of DME, diabetic macular edema. And so it's always struck me as odd um, for two things. One is we wait till the patient gets DME, the end stage disease, before we think about treating. And secondarily, even when we treat them, we treat them with this PRN treatment extent, which is a chronic under treatment and ultimately the, the patients don't do as well as they could. So really what I'm very interested in is not only treating diabetic macular edema, but treating diabetic retinopathy and treating diabetic retinopathy almost as soon as it's there. And you should be able to intercept the disease. And that, that's the ambition here with this molecule. Thanks for that, Pete. A similar question to you, Catherine, where do you think you can get with this technology and how do you think it's gonna impact patients? I think it's going to be a complete paradigm shift in the treatment of diabetic eye disease. Um, one of the, the very early things is one of our founders, Steve Harper's father, had um, regular injections into the back of his eye, uh, not actually for diabetic disease, but for wet age-related macular degeneration, which is a, a chronic disease of the retina requiring monthly injections directly into your eye. And he hates it. And I, again, before we even started the company, went to talk to his physician, who happened to be the head of the Macular Society. And he said, um, I hate giving the injections. At the beginning, it was kind of interesting and fun. It was a new step forward. But actually, I don't want to do this. I did not qualify in medicine to stick needles in people's eyes. So there was a, a sort of a belief that patients didn't like it and doctors didn't like it. And we felt very strongly that if we could make an eye drop, it was a big step forward. That if we were still delivering a molecule that required a needle, it, it might improve the treatment. But actually, that was not what we wanted to do. It was to take away the treatment burden for patients and deliver a, an effective treatment. And that's some very, very important. It has to be effective. Um, patients are going blind and there's no point giving something that is not as effective as current treatments, whether or not they don't like the, the injection. So what we set about to do was to make a huge change in how patients were treated whilst delivering something that helped improve their loss of vision and that we wanted it to be more effective than current treatments. So it had to be better and delivered better. And I think, as, as Pete says, this starts off in diabetics as a retinopathy, which then progresses to a macular edema, and then you go blind. And if you can stop that progression, probably about 50% of diabetic patients will get some deterioration in their eyesight. And if we could stop that, that would be an enormous and just to give some ideas of the of the amount of money that's spent on the the leading drugs in this space so what market size would if, if your technology works catherine what market size of are we talking about this is like you know this is game changing technology you're yeah. talking about a drop versus a monthly injection um, well, the, the monthly injections are spending annually about 12 billion dollars that's how big the market is at the minute um, it obviously depends on what price point Janssen decide to put this out at, how big the market that they will get. Um, those drugs at the moment are, have not gone generic, so perhaps that will drop, but it's huge market. 
And people are getting older and fatter and more diabetics. It's going to grow unless something changes dramatically. I mean, the leading drug at the moment, Aliyah, or the potential leading drug, I would say, is, is potential to have around five and a half billion of sales. And this would uh, compete directly with that. Uh, apart from, I can't see how it would compete with a, a drop in that sense or with, with this drug. So I think... Well, it's, a little, you know, it's, a little, it's a little different. So what, one of the okay. things you need to be mindful of is that um, sometimes where you, where you present in the clinic and you have pretty obvious disease, um, there may be a need to inject because physicians in general, particularly in AMD, they don't like you leaving the office if you're not controlled because you can have a catastrophic event on the way out of the building. And so there may be an opportunity here to blend injections with, with eye drops. The idea is that for the acute situation, you need an injection, uh, but then you take eye drops and you monitor, and hopefully you never need another injection. But even if you share the market with Alea, it's still two and a half billion. <laughs> it's just yeah, but it, it's, not, it's not a question of that. I mean, the market's actually bigger than that. So rough estimate, it's about 11 billion. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't account for off-label use of Avastin because that's not counted in that 11 billion. And also none of these drugs are being used in retinopathy patients. They're just not being used. And the reason is it, it is a cost thing. It is a burden thing for patients. And it's just clinical space. They don't have the space to, I, to, to, be, to be queuing down three ways. I think the interesting thing from people, some of our listeners are not all from biotech, is that the, uh, I think the numbers that we're talking about, whether it's three, five or 12, they're all very large numbers if this mm. uh, technology works. It's game-changing technology, and that's what we do in biotech. We're looking for game-changing technologies that can address very large markets and help patients. And so I'm quite lucky in our job and, and, and what we do and how we do that. Uh, there is a question that I wanted to um, uh, uh, ask from Rajik, actually. Rajik Ibrahim, he's actually CSO of Pencil, which is a new startup um, um, that, he, that he's just getting off the ground. And um, he's asking, I mean, his background is probably quite a lot of ac academia and academic, but he is a, a very well-known scientist in his space. He's probably thinking, how do I connect with Big Pharma? Do I cold call them? I don't know lots of people. Um, I'll answer that first. And if anyone wants to jump in with the answer, I, I, so my, Rajik, my answer to that would be, is it's very, uh, I wouldn't cold call um, Big Pharma or investors in, in that case. Um, they have so much uh, inflow coming in. They almost rely on their network to screen things for them. Uh, and so as, a, as a, an investor, or, and I imagine it's the same as Pete, but I will ask and let him answer is, do you have so much inflow, um, unless you go in through a warm contact, it's, I think it's quite difficult to do a deal with a big farmer. Um, and we'll, t we'll talk about how the deal is done, I think, in the next question around having a champion, et cetera. But uh, do, you, do you guys agree with that, my answer to, to Rajik, or do you think he, they should cold call you guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you can find a, a way in this on a cold call, um, I mean, I think one of the things that Johnson & Johnson does best, and in this case it is Johnson & Johnson or Janssen, is that we have this hub of innovation centers. We have one in London, we have one in California, we have one in Boston, and essentially we have one in Asia Pacific um, that also looks after Australia. And really these are, in a sense, triage centers. And so actually from our retina within, within Janssen sits in cardiovascular metabolism. So we have a VP level um, person in each of those hubs and their job is to screen and um, basically develop. And each of those hubs will also have a transactor. And so even if we get to, those hubs will really take it all the way through. Now those hubs are designed to take um, programs that are pre-clinical POC. If your program is post-clinical POC, uh, you need to talk to Janssen Business Development and that's a different organization, although they do work together. Um, but you know, you, you can, if you can find a guy's name, you can call call. If it's really brilliant science, we're going to take a look. Yeah. I will, I know Pete's on the other side of that, but I, I think uh, J and J's model is quite different. They do have these innovation hubs dotted around the world. Um, and they're probably, it's quite different really to how most general pharma work. But my experience on the other side of a small biotech it's, it's always good to, to go through. And I just want to quickly run to, uh, the, to actually Catherine's point now and, and drill there is like, in order to actually get this deal over the line, you know, you mentioned a couple of times that you had to have a champion. You had to find someone who could do that and you sort of helped, and, you know, Pete was there and he, he helped champion the deal. But so um, 
I just wanted to answer how important was it for you to have that champion in getting the deal actually over the line and done? Um, and what frustrations did you have in trying to get the deal over the line? And I'll ask the mirror question to you in a second, Pete. Um, Pete certainly got us in through the door. And I am certain that Pete fought many a fight on our behalf that I didn't even know was happening. Um, once we were being taken seriously, which actually was very fast, the level of due diligence that was being done was huge. I have never on either side, and I've been in big pharma and I've been in small companies, I have never seen due diligence like so, that. So, so, I mean, it's just good to imagine this. So you're a small biotech, j and J is a big pharma. How many people were in your team on the phone conference and how many people were on the other team? Just so all the small biotech know what to expect if you're going to do a deal with a big pharma. We had four of us, the same four people on every phone call. Um, on the other end at Janssen, we probably had between 12 and 16 people different people, a, a sort of a couple of sort of project management people, deal doers who were similar, but we probably had between 12 and 16 people on every phone call and we would do one in the morning, 12, 16 people, four of us would have lunch, do another one with a different 12 to 16 people. And what level of due diligence did they do on your program? How, what sort of level of detail do they go into when, when, when you do a deal? What to what, um, how, how should a biotech be prepared for that? I think we were quite well prepared before we even started because um, from the get-go, I'd intended to do a deal. So I had ensured that we had data rooms up and running. I could have opened a data room within 24 hours of somebody asking at any time when we, from when we set this company up and they were up to date and they were accurate. Um, I, it was pulled apart. It was like every single thought you'd ever had, had to be justified several times over. So, so I, I, let, we get the picture that it was, it was about a murder that you hadn't committed and you had to justify where you had been every minute of the day and why you had done that. I've got a great question from an appendix at Siemens here in the US. He's asking, how did you do, how did you allow due diligence on, uh, on what you were doing? How did you give away enough information whilst maintaining confidentiality? Um, and what happened if then J&J walked away during the deal? And how would you maintain all the risk of providing with them with all that information and, uh, and, and risk losing it all in a sense? Um, is it just trust or? Because it's quite a close industry. We all know each other in, in, in the space, I guess. Did you rely on that? or um, A huge amount because we had to answer their questions. We didn't actually disclose the structure of the molecule till last five minutes, really, I suppose. Yeah. But until then, we were completely transparent, completely honest. Um, I, I felt that if we could answer the questions well and if they trusted us and if we were seen to be transparent and not hiding anything we had a very good chance of getting this deal done but it took nine months yep. every single day every single minute yeah. so I'm, I, there's that pete's looking down at you going yeah I know. You know, so on the other on the pete on the other side how was it working yeah. for you so the first thing i would say is when i picked up the phone that day to catherine i said i'd do it in six weeks i apologize for that <laughs> took, I, I, by my count it took 10 months yeah. And, and, that's, and that is reflected, actually, of the due diligence process. I have never seen a due diligence process like this anywhere I've ever worked. And you, you said, so now, you know, what did they do? How did they do this? We even requested raw data out of data that comes straight out of instruments. And we have a, a group that actually will replot every graph that you, that you have shown in your reports or shown in your slides. And, you know, you... There was no real problems here, um, but I've seen it. I've seen it when there are, and it just stops the situation. So the one piece of advice I'd give to any company that was looking to get into that type of arrangement with Janssen would be make sure that your data is 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 sound, is well prepared. There's no transcription errors, and and all the statistics have been properly done because they will be looked at. 
I'm getting, there's quite a few questions around confidential in IP and how to, so at what point would, uh, would you generally cite in a CDA with a, with a, an invention of well, biotech? It, it, just, I think like everybody else, I mean, we, we, we would look to do, we looked at the science initially, we'd, we'd ask for a non-confidential deck. Um, and then, um, and then we'd, if the science was interesting enough, we'd move to a confidential, uh, a confidentiality agreement. Yeah, we, we don't want to contaminate ourselves. So, we would insist that we do not want to see structures um, until very late in the day. And so we'd be on the cusp of the deal before we'd want to see structures. Uh, and of course, structures could kill it, but um, you, you have to take that risk. We spend a lot of um, people's time and salaries uh, doing the due diligence. As, you, as you've heard, it's an enormous endeavor for us. Um, and we trust that there won't be anything horrific about the, the, the structure. Um, but it's a chance you have to take. And then, you know, you, then you go to a, a different level, you see the structures and hopefully you, you sort of complete on the deal. I just want to move the discussion on a little bit because uh, I think, you know, why we all do this, I and mean, we obviously we need to uh, do this for our own commercial reasons, for our own companies, but ultimately it's, we want to see our ideas get through to patients and have an impact. And the question that I'd like to pose to you both is, if and start with Catherine really is if you went a different route i.e you took on a series b investment which i guess is the alternative to a, a, the significant deal with j and j do you think you would have uh, had the because now you've been part way through the collaboration with j and j do you think the kind of uh, information that you share knowledge you work uh, you share um things you do together that you would get there any faster in any other route or do you think this is the best way to get your idea and invention in, in, into patients uh, so the, the question to you do you think a series b or a big pharma collaboration big pharma collaboration i absolutely um i'm convinced of it we had set up the usual how are you going to collaborate so we have a joint steering committee and then subgroups out of that the level of expertise that resides within those subgroups within Janssen is unbelievable. Um, we have a call, they are terribly collaborative. Um, there's no, I, I was slightly worried at getting into bed with a big farmer that we would just become sort of pushed around, told what we had to do, and it would be one of those nightmares that you just get through to the far end. It's actually a really big learning curve. It's a real pleasure to do it. And um, the speed is, what well, the speed probably, the speed is not right because there are decision-making groups within Janssen, which I have no idea about. But um, in that, if you ask X and eight, um, can you decide this? We can decide it in five minutes. You know, Loic just asks me and yep or no. Whereas Janssen, there are layers upon layers of decision making. That having been said, um, I think we will avoid very many potholes that we could fall down simply because the people in Janssen have been there, done it, avoided them in the past and are so, open and willing to share that. So, so, so you appreciate the, um, the, ex the, the experience of actually developing a drug um, and actually how to get it to patients in the most efficient and uh, uh, fast way possible uh, and make sure you, you get the sort of the right data at the other end that you're now enables you to register your drug and get to patients essentially. Yes. That's the, the knowledge and experience that a big pharma like J&J &J can add. So on the other side, like, uh, Pete, I'm gonna flip it for you, is to why, why did you, uh, why does a J&J &J or other big pharma in general, why do they, seek to get this um, innovation from tiny little biotechs like Exonate, who, you know, it's, you know, it's, there's a small number of people there, less than 10, single digit, and they've, they've, uh, they're developing this innovation. Why is J&J &J looking to reach out to small organizations now like Exonate? Yeah, because well, it's all about the idea. It's all about the idea and the science. And we're totally agnostic on where we get the, the good ideas from. Happy to, to develop them in-house for our discovery organization, but equally happy to source them from the external world at whatever level. And, you know, even with the, the hugeness of Janssen, we're still small compared to the academic world. And, you know, people have grown up with the careers 
And if you look at the chief scientific officer of, of Vaccinate, you know, he's developed an entire knowledge base around this really from scratch. So he is a complete expert in this space. We don't have such an expert. So, you know, there was a compelling idea, a compelling reason to believe and, and a compelling program. And so, we, as I say, we will source preclinical, clinical, um, pre-POC, post-POC, as long as we like the idea. And speaking to the, the mechanism, you know, it, it's a slow burn within a complaint, Jens. And so I take it forward, I take it to a committee, and I have to convince them that the, the approach is doable. And that's really where the champion comes in, because somehow the guys at Exnet have to communicate to me so that I'm almost at the level that they are in terms of my understanding of the program, because I'm going to ask a lot of questions and you, you guys are not in the room for that. It's just me. And so I get it through that committee. Then it goes to the TA. Are we going to spend some of our money on this as a therapy area? Then it finally, it goes to the head of R and D. And then it ultimately it goes to um, what we have is called global operating committee uh, company. Um, and they, and they ultimately make the decision to pay them money. And the decision is based not on the upfront or the milestones, it's, bit, it's based on the whole deal. Yep. Just, just as a question from Sean there, just on the, sort of the, on the, the market really. Um, so I don't know if you have the answer, but can you give some granularity, granularity on the potential market positioning or pricing? Uh, if it's successful, uh, will the US and Europe be the key, key markets for this? Um, as I think, as always, the US and, the, and, and Europe would be the key markets, but um, what, one, of the, one of the benefits of this is that obviously it's not injected. And so if you think about the current therapies for these types of diseases, um, cold chain supply, um, sterile conditions need to inject, it's a problem in, in you know, the developing world. So this, this could lend itself to be much more user-friendly in the developing world. In terms of pricing, we, we haven't got there yet. That's, we're, still in, you know, we're still in early clinical development. Uh, but there'll be a village of people that uh, once we see some um, likely POC, uh, some proof of efficacy, some proof of pharmacology, there'll be a village on this who will, who will determine all that. Not just pricing, but market access, uh, working with health technology assessment groups to, to find out um, what we need to do. And, and all of this is just, you know, very clever people, uh, but a village of them. And, and that's why I think it's quite difficult for a small company to take it all the way through yeah. to, 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 in this space. Yep. No, I, I agree with that. And I can, you know, just, just to finish that part of the conversation off, I think that, you know, there is a real synergistic relationship here where innovation ideas are being nurtured and developed in a lot of the small biotech I, could, I, could, I work with. And on the other side, having worked collaboratively with Big Pharma, they, have, they add a lot, a lot to the, lot to the um, innovation. I think when we can work together like this in an ecosystem that uh, we, we supports each other, I think we can have much better outcomes for patients. And it kind of leads to the question from Yurik is like, we've seen with COVID-19 how timelines are being slashed for, for, for the vaccine that we all uh, hope that comes through quickly um, and do you and I guess it's a question or you can comment is um, do we feel that this kind of collaboration and the technology we have in front of us and working together in a way that you guys are doing obviously very well do you think the timelines of, of drug discovery and development we can we can change the paradigm there I'm not, I'm not sure if I really understood the question, but I mean, um, but, 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 you know, can we change? Can we change the, the so. timescales of of development by um, all the technology that we now have that we didn't have five or ten years ago? Oh, I see. Um, well, ultimately, I think you know one of the one of the impacts that COVID nineteen has had on the entire pharmaceutical world is that elective elective procedures are really not happening at all. Um, and that, that to a large extent is including people going in for their eye, eye injections. So, you know, it, really it's a little bit like dentistry. People are only getting emergency treatment. Um, and so, I mean, the whole thing's been hit. I mean, I think one of the things that's, that's has benefited this collaboration is that we're still in the document creation process and um, pre, you know, pre-starting in the clinic. And so really, I don't think we've been delayed at all. And certainly all the improvements in the IT and meeting, meeting elements has helped that. Um, hopefully, I don't think our timeline, timeline should be overly impacted by COVID-19. 
and, and part of that is we'll be doing these studies in part of the world which actually hasn't suffered um, too badly from the COVID-19 situation. But in the, in the rest of the world, it's been pretty devastating. Yeah. No, I mean, coming to the co Sorry, yeah. Catherine, go ahead. I think what Sunil was asking was, is the fact that we have shown that things can be speeded up in terms of regulatory or skipping corners, is that going to impact other areas of drug development? I am not sure that it will. And the reason I'm not 100% sure is that um, it's about risk. You do one, two, three, four in that order because you don't want to waste money on doing four if, if step two is going to tell you to kill this project. And with COVID, because this is a pandemic and this is a, a global emergency, that we are doing things differently and perhaps wasting money that we wouldn't normally waste, we would do things in the right order. And when we all settle down and start doing drug development again, we'll get back to doing it in a very regulated way that we do. What I, other thing I think with, with COVID is that people are learning to collaborate and maybe that will stay um, because people are pulling in ideas from different places into a market that doesn't exist at the minute. If you, if you look in ophthalmology, um, there's not so much collaboration because people are still competing with each other and COVID is breaking things down and everybody is putting their thoughts together, which is fantastic. But I, I think then we'll go back to separate boxes. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, agree, with, I agree with that. I think, you know, because the regulatory agencies have moved quickly on these emergency situations. I don't think that means they're going to change the way they do business after this. It so, might, so just, it. just to tidy off the the uh, COVID question. I mean, uh, I mean, the world we're in the spotlight as a industry at the moment. Um, and you know, I think if, from what I've seen, it's it's been amazing how um, everyone I think is just pulling their weight and and trying to do the right thing here. What's J and J doing? Are you aware of what J and J is doing in this space, Pete? I'm, I'm not sure myself, but uh. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly no official spokesman for the COVID nineteen response. We have a we have an enormous team on this internally, but I mean, it's public. It's publicly disclosed that we are making a vaccine, uh, trying to make a vaccine, um, and there's been an awful lot of emphasis put on that. Huge huge amounts of resourcing, and also at um, creating manufa manufacturing capacity at risk. But you know our infectious disease group are also um, taking looking at uh, treatments rather you know outside of the vaccine space, yep. um, and so um, they're also heavily involved in that right now. And um, I recently um, had a, a couple of um, um, clinical programs sort of um, yep. approved to, to go forward in that. Yep. And, and uh, Catherine, do you have any comment on the COVID nineteen landscape and the biotechs and how they're working? Well, I. I mean, it's such an overwhelming thing for the whole world, isn't it? That everybody is considering how they could help. Um, we, I mean, we have looked at, is there anything at all in our armamentarium that could be useful in this area in any way? And I think that's what probably every single biotech company is doing. So, I've got, so can I go back to a couple of the questions? I can see Professor... Giamis at Sussex uh, has a question that a lot of people want me to ask. So if if J&J uh, &J decide to can the program, as he puts it, um, what happens to the project then? I knew this would come up as a question because it's a regular one. So if, if we decided to discontinue the program and, and that would be not exercising our option, then the, then the program would go back to, to x and and they would be free to do what they will. Uh, there might be some commercial terms around that but um, that, that's what would happen. So it's, if, we, if we decided to not pursue it, it would go back to Exonate and, and they would be free to sell it to another farmer, continue development as they wish, change the development path, whatever they want. Yep. We, we deliberately got that term because let's imagine that Janssen decide to drop their ophthalmology franchise and we actually have a viable drug we didn't want it to just bite the dust and go nowhere. There's the other scenario is Janssen don't exercise the option because it doesn't work, in which case we will do nothing with it either. But if there's just a business alteration 
that happens within Janssen, we, we wanted to be able to continue. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, you know, that, and, and the, to decide not to develop a program uh, may have nothing to do with its, with its efficacy or its safety. It yeah. just, it could be strategic. And, and I, for one, um, would always like to have that clause because I don't want to see useful drugs uh, by the dose just because we hold the, we hold the license to it, um, but we decided to go another way. So I think it's, we're coming up to the end of our time, but I'm going to ask sort of one final question, uh, unless there's anything else I need to... Uh, I think we've covered most of the questions. So it's really to, to uh, first uh, to Catherine to say, look, if you could do the whole thing again, uh, the whole process again with uh, J and J, what would you change around about Exonet and how you managed the way you manage your team? So it's more self-reflection rather than on J and J because that would be difficult to us <laughs> on, on a live call. So how would you change what you do and and improve what you your process? <laughs> In trying uh, to do the deal itself. In actually doing the deal, yeah. Self-reflection, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Do you know, I'm not, because there were so few of us, I'm not sure there was much we could do different. We were as responsive as we could be. Um, so if, if Jansen said, could you talk to us at midnight, we said yes. Okay, to be controversial then, so what would you request J&J &J do differently? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> It's probably the cider that's got to me, but I have to answer. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that um, Janssen were as transparent and J&J &J itself as they could be. But actually, um, when you look at a company that big, you can't see what their decision-making processes are. So you could talk to 10 people, but actually you don't know if a single one of those 10 people is there because they can say yes. They can all point out what the problem is and, and lead to a no, but actually you never know who is the yes person. Yeah. It would be nice to actually meet the yes person on day one, that you know who this individual is that you, you need to um, convince, and we never found out who the yes person was. Okay, so that's a great way to go over to Pete, <laughs> to say, first on self-reflection, how could J and J do things better? I'm sure you've been through the process many times. And secondly, what would be your advice to other biotechs going through this? Or things that you thought were important they should consider when doing a deal? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to reiterate the fact that Xnet was unbelievably um, responsive, and you know, our questions were always met with good answers. And I know ten months seems like a very long time, but it's it's not a crazy amount of time when you look at what we have to go through through uh, through Janssen. You will never get to meet the decision makers on day one. I'm sorry, Catherine, they're just never going to happen. That would be the president of pharmaceuticals and a global head of R&D because they're going to make this call, um, particularly a deal um, that, that's got a significant value. Um, on reflection, um, I really wanted this deal um, from, as I said, from day two, really day one, but I couldn't, didn't have a computer on day one. Um, and I was absolutely adamant that I was going to get this. So what I would do differently is I wouldn't send um, emails that, that were so pointed to my colleagues that were less supportive. To tell you how long it took, the, Pete phoned me the day my grandson in Australia was born. So I was in Australia and the day we did the deal, he stood up. That's how long it took. <laughs> I'm just going to ask a final question because I know that Yuri's uh, has asked it and he's doing a, a, a research project at Cambridge around this. Um, I still mentoring him, so I know what he's doing, but he's, he's wondering about probably, I guess, around the milestone payments to do with the deal. And would a company like uh, Exonet ever sell them on? Hmm. Oh. Or could they? Yeah, yeah, we might have to. Yes, is the answer. You do that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And we put that into the deal that we could, because um, I mean, royalty payments are, of, of, are often sold on, yeah. but not milestone payments. Yeah, but um, it's the deal is so long that potentially we could all be sitting on the beach going, "Did the check that month come? Did anybody notice? Did the check come?" It's that far out into the future. So for the stakeholders in Exonate if it becomes more sensible to sell them on and pay everybody out and go and be happy, we would definitely do that. That's, that's a clear answer for you, Yuri. So on that note, 
I would like to wrap it up. Either of you got any final comments you would like to make? Otherwise, we, yep, sorry, Pete. No, the final comments was this. I, I do think it's a good deal. I think it's a great opportunity for patients. And I, yeah, I really hope it works. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> yes. Catherine? I think it's a good deal. Um, when we first started talking to J&J, &J, um, we were warned off them as a company that they would take forever and they would never do a deal with you and don't waste your life with them. I would say to anybody talking to J&J, &J, it is a bit of a rocky road as you go through the due diligence, but if you've got a good science, just hang on in there because I think and I have worked in a lot of big pharma. I think it's a tremendous company and they are undeniably terribly pleasant and easy to work with as we go forward. Well, on that note, I would, sorry, Pete, you're going to say something. Just one, like, one no, we're not. You're about thing. to say, no, we're not. <laughs> sorry. One, one very last thing, just on that business. So it did take a while. And then about halfway through that process, um, I had to go to the head of um, external innovation and they approved the deal first. And the only question that the guy asked me was, because we discussed the deal terms, he said, is it fair to both sides? And I felt I could answer yes, and uh, it moved forward from there. So th th there, is, there is a real willingness from the Anson side for it to be a fair deal for both sides. No, and uh, look, I thoroughly enjoyed this uh, webinar. It's been a pleasure to, to chair it. And I th thank you for, b for both of you being as honest and candid as you possibly can. <laughs> And uh, no, I appreciate that. And thank you to all the people that are listening in um, for all your questions. have been great. There's a bit of banter going on. I can see in the, the Q&A between some people we know, which is which all good fun. So thank you that for everybody. And uh, we'll see you oh, next week's webinar. So next week's webinar, we're going to cover a very important topic, which is uh, around um, antibiotic resistance. And we're going to have the head of um, R&D for um, uh, Carbex chairing the session. Um, Erin, and then we're going to have a number of biotechs and possibly a big pharma, we're just trying to uh, firm that up, uh, who are very into this space and the infectious disease space. So we're going to have three CEOs of biotechs and a big pharma as, uh, on the panel. So I won't reveal who they are yet, uh, but it should be a really interesting session, a very important session given what's happening uh, with COVID-19. And we could go through, you know, there's only a few antibiotics that work very well. Um, so this, you know, we could go through something similar. So it's important we uh, discuss and address that topic with some of the real important people in the industry who are shaping it. So thank you very much on that, on that note and uh, hopefully see you next week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.